This is a work of political and social commentary. The content of this video is not meant for children under the age of 13. Parental discretion is advised. With all the viral news going around, most people have forgotten about the presidential primaries. Honestly, when compared to an existential threat like a global pandemic, presidential primaries don't seem that important. But they are. The primary season is still ongoing and November is coming. So where are we in the primary process and how does the pandemic change things? Sounds like a topic for some roasted opinions, now doesn't it? First things first, the Democratic National Convention has been postponed from July 13th to August 17th. Partly that's to make sure that there's plenty of time before the convention to deal with COVID, and partly that's because a number of state primaries have been postponed until June. It makes sense, given the fact that the DNC insists on providing as much grace period as possible on absentee balloting, that they have to allow states enough time to count all of the ballots and report the results before the convention. With Bernie Sanders dropping out, Biden is now the presumptive nominee for the DNC. The DNC also has to face the distinct possibility that they will not be able to reschedule their primaries in time for the national convention due to COVID concerns. If that happens, the DNC will have to determine how to proceed. Technically, the nomination process is internal to each party. The DNC could very well decide to forego further voting and either nominate from the state committees or from the floor, with hundreds if not thousands of delegates pledged to Biden without primary voting. The Republican Party doesn't face these issues as the president has already won enough pledged delegates to secure the nomination. If the rest of the primary contests have to be canceled, the results would be the same for the Republicans. In fact, some primaries were already canceled before COVID because each state party committee determines how to assign their delegates. Usually that means holding an election, but some states allow party committees to assign their delegates to the incumbent without a primary. Before I go on, I want to make absolutely clear that my fervent prayer is that no one else becomes sick with COVID. No one. There is enough ill health going around without wishing for it. Both parties have to face up to the possibility, though, that their nominee may not be alive during the general election. In the Republican Party's case, one can safely assume that Mike Pence will become the nominee if Donald Trump contracts and succumbs to COVID, seeing as he would already be the president for the same reason. For the Democratic Party, however, the situation is quite muddled. Once, just once in the history of the United States has the nominee died before the Electoral College met, in 1872 when Ulysses Grant ran against Horace Greeley. Greeley died between the election and the Electoral College resulting in his delegates being split between four alternate nominees. The candidates still in the race are in their 70s. They are in the population identified as particularly vulnerable to this virus. It's possible that both candidates will contract this virus, and even possible that both could die from COVID. The candidates know this, which is why both candidates have effectively suspended normal campaigning during the pandemic. That presents a distinct advantage to Trump due to his daily briefings about COVID keeping him in the news, no matter how many media outlets carry or refuse to carry those briefings. Joe Biden is doing some internet campaign appearances, but to little effect. What's more, he not only continues to ignore protective measures like not touching his face, but also looks and sounds distinctly ill at the moment. During one appearance, he looked like he was wearing makeup to conceal the fact that he is pale and blurry-eyed with reddened nostrils and a raspy voice. So, what if Biden, the presumptive Democratic nominee, is gone? Does Sanders take over as nominee? Do the candidates who have dropped out with delegates contend the nomination? Only the DNC can answer that question, and my guess is that they don't even want to think about it. What if the nominee dies after the convention, similar to what happened to Horace Greeley? To whom does the torch pass? It's been nearly 150 years since that scenario happened, and my research indicates that neither party has an answer for that question yet. Nor does the Constitution indicate what happens if the president-elect dies before assuming office, much less before the Electoral College meets. As I said before, this line of inquiry is into questions which no one wants to have to answer. It addresses possibilities which no sane person wants to happen. But with COVID going around, I think perhaps it's time for both parties to answer them, just in case. 
Meanwhile, the only campaign news of any significance is an accusation of sexual assault leveled at Joe Biden. This accusation is problematic for a couple of reasons. First, the alleged assault reportedly occurred in 1993, a full 27 years ago and well outside the statute of limitations for most states. Second, there was no report filed at the time and no witnesses, which means that the accusation is unprovable. This is further complicated by the fact that Biden has a reputation for unsolicited gestures of affection like sniffing hair and hugging, something which has led to more than a few photo ops of women and even young girls pulling away from him. His accuser went to Time's Up, an organization which helps the victims of sexual assault, but they wouldn't touch the case because Biden is a presidential candidate and pursuing a case against him would jeopardize their nonprofit status. Filing a court case against a presidential candidate is considered a political activity, which is forbidden to nonprofit organizations. This has resulted in some serious tension between Bernie supporters and Joe supporters, including Rose McGowan and Alyssa Milano. The two charmed alumni traded barbs on Twitter. Their exchange is but one example of the hashtag Me Too versus hashtag Biden 2020 arguments which have simmered over the past few weeks far under the radar as COVID-19 has dominated the news cycle. Oh, and the Wisconsin governor wound up losing a couple of challenges in court when he tried to delay the primary election in his state at the last minute. The results won't be tallied until April 13th, but the precincts were open on the 7th as scheduled. The problem was that the governor tried to change the date by executive order, which is not how elections are scheduled and was overturned by the Wisconsin Supreme Court while others attempted to get every ballot received by 4 p.m. on April 13th counted, which the U.S. Supreme Court overturned partially, upholding the original restriction that absentee ballots must be postmarked by 8 p.m. on April 7th. Now, while I have to agree with both court rulings on the letter of the law, I also have to point out that refusing to reschedule the primary elections in the midst of a stay-at-home order was a dick move by the Republican-controlled legislature. Given the current circumstances, the election should have been rescheduled, both for safety's sake and to ensure the opportunity to freely participate for all voters. Wisconsin is under a stay-at-home order. Voters were standing in the rain, in masks and gloves, at social distance of at least six feet, for hours. The legislature should have voted to postpone the election, in my opinion. But I'm not from Wisconsin, and my opinion doesn't matter in the slightest to them. I'll be ever so glad when this pandemic is over. The world needs to get back to its normal level of stupidity. Stay safe out there, folks. Stay home as much as possible. Keep your distance when you are out. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. And wear a mask if you have even one symptom of respiratory illness.